Testing. Testing lecture. Here we go. Hello and welcome in lecture nine. Uh, as you can see from the horrible joke, uh, we are in a testing lecture today. So uh, we've covered testing a little bit before in this course so far, but kind of in this approach we've been taking where we um, close the loop early, right? We got even on the very first day in our hello chisel, we had the tiny, tiny test bench in order to animate our design, right? So it's been there since the beginning. We've been using it throughout the last few lectures, but today we're going to dive head first in the testing and talk about, you know, how should we structure them? What more features can we use? And give it a more proper treatment. Um, so I'm going to do a few things. I'm going to try to sell you on testing in general, which I think, you know, in addition to just good and be good for agile hardware design, it's good for hardware design. It's good for a lot of things. I think a lot of times uh, undergraduate and graduate curriculums don't emphasize it enough because it's not easy for us to assess, but it doesn't mean it's not important. It's actually extremely important. Um, and we'll do a few different things. We'll actually talk about doing testing combination component, using Scala tests, and then finally we'll do a stateful component, a queue, our, our favorite thing. Um, okay, so let's fire up a notebook. So, um, you know, naturally people say, well, why should I test? Well, uh, all these questions apply. You can basically even change where I say hardware and software is also true, right? Like, who wants a piece of hardware you tell me, I made this thing, but I don't know if it works. Okay, what am I supposed to do with that, right? Like, it's not very helpful to anybody. Um, and, you know, uh, when you're writing software, you might say, oh, my program's really fast. Like, is it correct? Like, speed does not matter unless it's correct in all cases, right? Same thing's true for hardware, right? If you have hardware that's partially buggy, I don't want it. You shouldn't want it. Um, it has to work, right? And the question is, okay, well, what does working mean, right? How do I prove to myself it works? Testing can help with that. Uh, how do I prove to others it works? Testing can definitely help with that. And it turns out, going a step further, um, testing is also how you can help you develop it, right? Where you may have heard this expression of test-driven development or TDD. Uh, that's a good idea, right? If you find yourself developing something and you aren't sure how to articulate a test, it sounds like you've not fully understood the problem. It's going to be hard to implement, right? You better be able to understand the problem once to actually articulate a test. That's the starting point, right? And then, you know, obviously to solve it well, you want to really understand that problem. But if you can't even articulate what you're trying to do in the form of a test, it's going to be rough, right? It's going to be real rough. And so you want to make sure stuff works, you prove to yourself it works, you prove to others it works, helps guide your development. Uh, and so you've been hearing this probably from a few instructors in your uh, careers. I'm going to pile on and join them. And even if in academia we can't give into of this, don't worry, in your first job in industry, uh, this will be, uh, I wasn't saying an appropriate word, but I'll say um, strongly <laughs> enforced, so to speak. Um, they will not take code without tests. Uh, you often will find out both in hardware and software, it's often a two to one ratio of people involved in tests versus actually developing. So chances are your job will probably be writing tests, right? <laughs> um, so that's how important testing is. But what are we going to cover today using this? Well, we're covering Agile techniques. We do Agile for testing, make it more efficient, uh, really generate these tests quickly. Hopefully get you excited about testing, not just part of the end verification, making sure the thing is right, but actually part of development will guide the development. And then, We'll do some examples, as always, kind of play around with things and tweak things. So in order to test, you actually have to get three things figured out. Uh, first, you have to have test cases. And by test cases, I mean inputs, right? So of course, you can have human-generated inputs, which are fine for getting started. Uh, but clearly, that's going to be very labor-intensive. That's also not going to be very scalable. Uh, you can have synthetically generate inputs. Perhaps you can do exhaustive things, random things. Perhaps in 2024, also LLM generated things. Um, okay, so let's say you have your test case. Are you done? No. Uh, you also need to know the right answer to your test cases, right? That's how you can make sure you did the right thing. <laughs> so you need the input, number one. Number two, you need the output, right? And so, like I said, for human generated ones, you can generate both the inputs and the outputs. This can work up to a set, up to a certain scale, but it's, it's brittle, right? You know, if you change something, you gotta change all the test cases. Uh, humans make mistakes. So maybe your very first test is going to be hand handwritten, but then from there on, you should probably figure out a way to make some sort of automation. Uh, so yeah, um, I think you're going to see me strongly proposing in this course, and the assignments are liberally constructed to make this possible, is model-generated testing. In other words, uh, we're going to have a implementation of the functionality you're trying to build, not in Chisel, 
in this course, typically in Scala, and we're going to use that to compare against, right? So that thing hopefully will be a very concise, simple Scala code that we convince ourselves is correct, and we'll compare the output to that. So basically, we have you know your hardware component and compare it against this model, and to make sure they match up. And so um, what's cool about that is that way, whatever test case you come up with, you can feed it to the model, and then you have the right answer to the model says, right? So you can compare against that. So it's a lot more robust and automated. Um, and then finally, after you have the input, the output, you actually need a way to run the tests, right? And so uh, you want something that's, you know, easy to set up, flexible, fast, etc. cetera. Uh, today, we're using the setup uh, from Chisel. Uh, in other words, we're going to be using Chisel tests, of course, to start a show, but that's powered by a few things. It's powered by Scala tests, which is, you know, a more general testing framework. Um, one thing we don't talk a whole lot about in this course, maybe it's worth mentioning this for a moment, uh, under the hood, right, when you run chisel, right, that, you know, builds up the design graph and elaborates it. Now, normally, you know, it might turn that design graph into Verilog, and perhaps without Verilog, you can either pass it off to a CAD tool to physically implement it on FPGA or ASIC, or you could uh, pass off to a Verilog simulator and simulate it in Verilog. Um, however, you know, in this course, when you're running, like, chisel tests on our assignments, we're actually using a different pathway called Treadle, which is a Fertile-based simulator. So Fertile is the intermediate representation inside Chisel, uh, and that is being directly simulated in Scala. Uh, this flow is nice. It, it works. Uh, very fast startup time. All Scala. Uh, that's awesome. Uh, unfortunately, uh, it may not be the future, right? Uh, with the newest versions of Chisel, uh, they are leaving behind both Chisel Test and Treadle. Uh, so uh, as I'm waiting for that landscape to stabilize, uh, this is why we're staying at 3.6 and not in Chisel 5. But I think by, Chisel, by the time Chisel 6 gets more stable, if it gets sorted out, there'll be a new Chisel test and that sort of stuff. But for now, this is why we're on 3.6 is because Chisel test is really awesome. We want to keep using Chisel test. And also, the simplicity of using Treadle uh, is really great. There are other simulation techniques. For example, like things like Verilator, or even my own research group develops a tool called Essence. Uh, these are all way faster once it's actually running, but it's a lot more complicated to get set up, and it's a longer startup time. And so because in this course we're doing pretty small designs, the difference in startup time is everything, right? If it starts instantly versus taking, you know, a few minutes to get started, that's already the entire thing, right? So uh, this won't matter. Perhaps at the very end of the quarter, if you're running a really, really big design for your project and you're doing a really exhaustive, long simulation, there you might consider using Verilator, and it's not too hard to turn, flip the switch for that that'll be faster. But don't worry, for this course, we're doing a lot with smaller designs. We'll be fine with this just treadle pass. Cool. Any questions so far? Cool. Okay. So like I said, for testing, you need to have an input, an output, and a way to actually, you know, execute it. Um, so just some things to keep in mind when trying new tests. Uh, number one, as I keep saying this course, close the loop, right? So do whatever it takes to have your design compiling and testing as soon as possible in your development process. Even if it's like the hello world of tests and doesn't really do anything substantial, get everything compiled and running, right? When you start having uh, errors and compiler issues, it's hard to debug all this, so you'd rather have this soldered out early and you kind of keep this elaborating and modifying it rather than trying to make these massive things come together all of a sudden. Um, so get close the loop early and use your test not just to test your thing to make sure it's correct, but also to even do test-driven development, TDD. Um, another thing to think about is this term coverage, which means, you know, what fraction of functionality uh, am I actually covering, or actually using my tests actually ex uh, exercise, right? You, you have a really big complicated thing in a one really simple test, and clearly there's a lot of functionality not being covered by that one simple test. So coverage is a metric people often use to try to track what fraction of things uh, they're doing. In this course, we don't have a strong coverage metric emphasis, but... Um, it's so worth thinking about, you know, in other words, you know, what fraction of functionality am I actually testing, right? Um, the third thing is also worth considering, that is, when you're designing your test cases, um, how much you go about doing it in terms of, do you design knowing about what's inside the module testing, or design oblivious what's inside the module testing? So you may have heard the terms uh, black box testing, or white box testing, or even gray box. Um, here I'm proposing alternative terminology of opaque and clear, but basically the idea is, uh, I recommend both, right? Uh, you do want to do some opaque or black box style testing where you just read the API specification and the better to do the right thing based on that. You want to make sure that's what the user's experience, that's what you want to make sure is correct. However, by peeking inside, you know, knowing the mutation, uh, you can better hit some edge cases, right? Because sometimes you do things like random 
you know, the odds of you hitting in certain corner cases is unlikely, but if you look inside and you know it's implemented, you can be much more intelligent about trying to uh, trigger those edge cases. Cool. Questions? Okay, we can keep going. So, as you can tell, really excited about testing today. Uh, and I keep on emphasizing, right? Get testing early, right? Don't just wait till the end. Don't just develop the entire freaking module and say, all right, test, you know, please. And no, write tests from the beginning. It's not just a matter of getting the right design. It's also going to make your life easier, right? If you have a design that um, needs to be debugged or developed, you're going to find it's way easier when you have tests. Uh, it's going to actually save you time in the long run. You've probably already experienced this, if not in this course and other courses, where the time it takes to implement something is not simply a matter of how fast you can type, right? It was simply just a sprint for how fast can you type? Well, you'd be done in minutes, right? And you can see even for this course, you know, our solutions, they're getting longer as the time are getting bigger, but they aren't that long, right? So it's, there's a lot of thinking involved. And trust me, the testing will not only help you get the thing correct sooner, it'll help guide your thinking. And yes, it will definitely help you get the whole thing done with less effort. Even though it seems like you're doing extra work, both the design and the test, trust me, getting the test going early really help. Um, you can do tests in a lot of different ways. It's not just when you're running locally. You can also have continuous integration, meaning it runs on some server for you in the background. Uh, you can do it working with each other, especially for things like the project. Um, or you can do things like design exploration, right? Where you want to consider a lot of different possibilities and see, for example, how they perform. Well, in this case, your test isn't so much testing for uh, functionality. It's actually measuring performance in the simulation. You want to just see how they all do, right? Um, and so really embrace testing. And as a result, don't just do it early. Consider early in the process and design for it. If you design your modules and make them easy to test, this is a good thing, right? Um, if you have modules in your design, you're like, I have no idea how to test this. Uh, that suggests what the module is doing is hard to specify and perhaps really complicated. You might think about uh, a different hierarchy, different abstractions. Um, as part of designing things to be easy to test, you find that combinational modules uh, are often the easiest to test, right? Uh, so sometimes you can get by by having these purely combinational modules that are really easy to test. And in the places where you need state, you can kind of be more deliberate and kind of encapsulate and make that complexity more controlled. Cool. Okay. So uh, now, of course, that was pretty general about hardware, specifically for Chisel. Um, people might ask, are generators hard to test? Uh, yes. However, here's the thing, right? To prove... Your generator is correct for all possible outputs from your generator. Oof, that, that's going to be tricky, right? Uh, but what you can do is you can make, this is like you have a parameterized hardware generator. You can have a parameterized hardware tester, right? So in other words, uh, you can take the same parameters as the module and parameterize your testing infrastructure, and you can generate testing infrastructure for that instance. So as a result, the user will be testing an instance produced by your generator with uh, tests, you know, produced by your test generator, those two working together, and guess what? That's actually pretty satisfactory, right? The thing you're actually going to use is the instance, and so having that be tested is actually pretty good, right? Now, I think it's an open research question, how could you, you know, go about making a methodology to prove something about the testing of generators for a large design space? And that's actually a pretty cool problem. Perhaps you'd want to use formal methods, but I said, for this course, what we're going to do is we're going to make parameterized testing infrastructure you can test that specific things. Um, as I mentioned before, we're going to use chisel tests. It's made for this stuff. It's great. Uh, it actually technically runs your tests as a scholar program, you know, as you're running, and it communicates to your simulation of design. Right now, like I said, the simulation's running in Scala 2, but if you use Verilator or other uh, APIs, it, the simulation may actually be running in Google Plus or something else, and it communicates back to the Scala program where your, simulation, where your chisel test bench is running. So, I said, Chisel Test is great because you can write test benches very naturally in Scala. Uh, a lot of their testing methodologies require you to write another language, uh, perhaps either Python or C++ or something, or even System Verilog, uh, and the result is not going to be as uh, familiar. As you mentioned a second ago for simulation, trials we're using, uh, it's easy to get started, um, but if you really need high performance, you can use look in the Verilator. It's a little bit more complicated and has a much longer startup time. Cool. Questions so far? Yes. So yeah, so great question. So if I have a system Verilog test bench, how portable is that? Um, well, if you have a system Verilog test bench, you need a solution to uh, execute Verilog, right? So out of the box, right, Chisel is a Scala-based world. Um, 
there are Verilog simulators. So yes, you need to use the chisel to generate the Verilog. And then yes, you can use that with the system Verilog or Verilog test bench, assuming your simulator supports that. Um, one caveat member is if you have a generator, your generator may be much more, may be much more parametrized than your system Verilog test bench. As a result, maintaining system Verilog test bench to match up to the flexibility of the generator may be complicated. For example, we have you know instances where we um, have parameterized number of ports, right? That would be a little awkward in Verilog. Doable, but awkward, right? Um, like I said, there's other, there's other things like Cocoa TV, which is like Python-based, trying to be more portable. There's stuff like that out there. Um, and yeah, I mean, this is kind of an inspiration. Today, we're going to live in the Scala chisel test world. But yeah, I mean, I think this is a place ripe for, you know, more ideas. Cool. So let's start off with something combinational, right? So when we say it's combinational, that means there's no internal state. You know, it's a pure function. Whatever the inputs are, it always produces the exact output no matter what. Um, so for the easy, you want to ask yourself, okay, well, what's, what's the possible inputs I'm considering? Uh, for the actual hardware design, what are the actual parameters for the generation capabilities? And how do the parameters perhaps impact the input space for the actual hardware inputs? And it turns out, if it's a simple enough design, you can actually just, you know, brute force, you can basically test every freaking input combination in your hardware design, you can do exhaustive testing. Um, now that's not always possible or not even usually possible, but if it is possible, why not, right? Have that full confidence. You know, you know for every input, it does the right thing. Um, other times you'll consider, you know, as I said here, turn down the parameters a little bit, perhaps turn down your bit width, and then, you know, you can still do exhaust tests for a small case, which is still better than not doing it, right? Okay, so let's try it out. Let's say we're going to do sign numbers, right? In this case, you know, yes, S exists in chisel, but let's say we're doing it in this, you know, uh, old style of called sign and magnitude. So we're going to have, uh, you know, the magnitude, which is the absolute value of number, in this case, a U int, it's W bits. And then we'll also have the sign, you know, single bit bool. If sign is true, it's negative. If it's false, it's positive. Um, and so, okay, how we might we go about doing this? Well, we can imagine... Let's say we build an adder for this. So, okay, so taking the two of these sine and magnitude bundles, produce one. In this case, you can see that they're all with W. So this is going to be, you know, truncating addition. And we see, oh yeah, the signs are the same. We simply just, uh, you know, copy the sign and then add the magnitudes. Now, by virtue of this first one clause not being true and getting down here, that means we have a scenario where they have different signs, right? So as a result, you know, one's gonna be positive, one's gonna be negative, you know, some trending back towards zero, so to, so to speak, when you add them together. So let's say, for example, we know that n zero is bigger. Well, if n zero is bigger, that means every sign n zero has is gonna become the output sign as well, and then we can subtract n one, some magnitude from n zero. However, let's say n one is, you know, um, magnitude's greater than or equal to n0, well then we can take the stuff from n1. But this is assigning magnitude arithmetic as assigned numbers. Cool. Questions. Okay, so we, we wrote this. I just explained hand wavily why it's correct. Perhaps I convinced you, perhaps not. Um, but we should test it to convince ourselves it's correct. Uh, and additionally, of course, this is all you know, a trivial example to fit on slides. So when you're writing this for real, you're gonna have much larger designs and you're gonna be much more unsure if it works or not, right? Um, so one thing you might do, like we've been covering so far, is we're going to go ahead and, you know, write a test, right? So we're going to maybe go poke some numbers, you know, say we'll do, uh, positive one plus positive two and make sure it says positive three, right? And because there's no exception, I guess that means it passed, right? If, you know, for example, I said it should have been negative three, it's, whoa, 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 I got positive three, right? So, um, okay, so far, so good. This is what you've been doing so far. And what we're going to show is how to structure some more sophisticated, more productive ways to uh, put this all together. Okay. So, uh, as I mentioned, uh, manually producing the correct outputs, that's going to be um, a liability eventually, right? Humans are error prone, also it takes time. So we want to build a model, right? So we're going to build a Scala function that does the exact same thing. Now, what's interesting is... Uh, we're, at, we're adding two integers in this case. Um, so, okay, so integers in Scala by default already are signed. They're actually also 32 bits, so 
if someone tries to do something bigger than 50 bits, we're going to tell them we can't do it. Um, but the issue is that, you know, we have a finite precision, only so many bits in their width. We want to capture a truncating behavior, right? So um, we do the addition, and then this complexity here is me doing the um, truncation while obeying signs. Um, if it's not super obvious on first glance, don't worry. It took me a couple minutes to figure this out. Um, but, okay, yeah, so for example, 4 plus 4 is 8. That makes sense. But, like, now if I do, like, 14 plus 14, we're thinking 28, but we only have 4 bits, right? So it's not going to fit in 28. It's going to wrap around at 12. And so that's what it's going to tell us. Okay, so, like I said, we have this Scala model, right? This model now will mimic the behavior of add with this finite precision, including for signed numbers. So that's pretty cool. So now let's go ahead and put this to work, right? And so uh, what we can do is get to the place where we can write test cases like this, right? We're going to say, hey, I want you to add, you know, uh, 2 and 3. I want you to add negative 1 and 5, et cetera. Um, how do we go about doing that? Well, uh, we have this model. And rather than doing a loss of the model here, why don't we use abstraction and put the interaction with the model and the component behind this function test add, right? So what's going to do? going to take in a component and it's going to use the model to actually do the math for us, right? So we're going to take, you know, two numbers. We're going to go ahead and, you know, convert these into the right inputs. For example, determine if the sign bit should be set, use the absolute values for the magnitudes. Um, this is um, for debug printing. We're actually, you know, printing out, you know, how it actually look. Um, also for debug printing, Debug printing. But then the key part is here, right? Uh, where we ask the model we just made to do the arithmetic for us, right? Now, okay, we can add the two things together. And notice how we, for example, say um, if it's not equal to zero, uh, we're also going to check the sign. And we are going to check absolute value no matter what. That's this portion down here. Uh, and go ahead and run this whole thing. Uh, it works, right? And you have the debug printing on, so you got 2 plus 3 is 5, and, you know, et cetera. We can even add one that we know is going to take advantage of the wraparound, like uh, like we, what we just did, like 14, 14. Right? And it gets the right answer of 12. Cool. You may notice that I have that comment saying, what is buggy here? Does anyone have an idea what it's referring to? Or maybe way back to your first year of undergrad and you took your digital hardware course and you learned about sign and magnitude and you learned about one's complement and you learned about two's complement. Why did two's complement win out? What's the flaw of sign and magnitude? Yeah, exactly. You have two zeros. You have negative zero and positive zero. And so that's kind of the issue is basically we don't check because of that possibility of having negative zero and positive zero, uh, we decided to just not check the sign bit <laughs> if it's zero. Um, cause yeah, you saw in this case, for example, we had one and negative one and got negative zero. That's a little weird. Um, but you know, we could specify, you know, for a hardware module, you know what, even though it's theoretically possible to encode negative zero, we're never going to use it. And zero always has to be positive. You could make that rule and then put in your test cases, for example, but we didn't have that requirement. We need to support it. And so that's kind of complexity here. Another thing I'll point out is we managed to make this a little bit tidier as a code base where for these test cases, it's pretty simple syntax, right? We take in this component we're testing, and then just the two numbers you want to add. And this function does a lot of lifting for us, right? It's actually doing a few things. You may notice, for example, our model requires a width parameter. We're getting the width from the module we're testing, right? And it's actually an important detail, because rather than passing the width as another argument here, another place humans can get it wrong, single source of truth is a common you know, programming technique, right? We're getting it from the module itself. And so if we go back a few slides to look at the module itself, you will notice that um, we made this a val, meaning it's public. So you can go ahead and grab it. Um, but cool. Yeah, we have uh, this really the right test cases. So already this is a much better, right? You know, going back to our first attempt to test this module, you know, all this work to do one test case that was manually generated. Now we can basically write them one line at a time. Uh, and as you can imagine, we're gonna start automating the process. Even here, 
this case is human generated inputs, model generated output, and this infrastructure is kind of harnessing some of the interactions for us. We're gonna to wanna to move on to even automated generated inputs in a second, but before we do that, questions so far? Yes. So you're asking is, could I synthesize my chisel test stuff to Verilog to run with Verilog tool? Is that the question or? So, so this is kind of the state of affairs for testing in chisel world is that if you use chisel tests, you're writing a scholar program using the chisel test API to talk to a simulation of your hardware design. In that case today, it's simulation is running in Scala with Treadle, but it could easily be running in Verilator or some, some commercial tool in Verilog. Um, so that's kind of the point. This is kind of co-simulation thing. You have, you know, this Scala program running a test bench and then the simulation you're talking to it. Um, part of why chisel test uh, was initially left behind on this chisel migration is an industry, the way to do things. They actually been writing their tests in two different forms. They've been writing it, uh, often actually as more chisel, not even chisel tests. So they write chisel components that are designed to test and assert things, but they have no intention of physically fabricating. Um, so these are often called checkers or watchers. So they actually are using the chisel functionality. Sometimes when you write models and test benches, you find you're doing some, a lot of work to try to like mimic the behavior of hardware. And it's like, why mimic the behavior of hardware? Why not just write hardware, right? And so that's that kind of methodology. Go, okay, well, let's, let's imagine hardware components that are perhaps too expensive to build or unreasonable to build, but work just fine in simulation and use those to generate stimuli, use those to compare things, use those to see the results, use those to do asserts. Um, so that's a common thing. What's nice about that approach is those tests are basically in chisel components. And so they can live in chisel, but then you can also turn them into Verilog and make it run with your Verilog tools. So then if you have a Verilog infrastructure, for example, that does things like coverage analysis for you, you can now see how all your tests are doing in coverage analysis. Chisel tests, as shown, does not have coverage analysis, for example. So these are reasons why people in the industry kind of like this methodology of using chisel to test chisel, right? <laughs> um, the other alternative, of course, is to write uh, test benches completely external to the chisel system and using system Verilog or Cocoa TV or something. Um, but yeah, uh, today we're in this course, we live in this nice, safe walled garden and we're able to do everything in Scala and it's, you know, works out pretty smoothly. Is that, can I answer your question? Okay. <laughs> cool. Um, great, so like I said, we, in this case, we have human chosen inputs, the rest is being automated. Let's now try and automate the input generation. So I promised we could do brute force testing. Let's do that, right? Let's say for a given width, we're gonna you know, figure out the, um, the range and then simply just uh, go from the entire range, right? So, okay, for two bits, um, it tested really instantaneously. We didn't even notice it. Four bits, yeah, so it actually did test a lot of things, right? Eight bits, yeah, now the poor thing's doing work. Um, for example, if we wanted to, just out of curiosity, uh, you know, count, uh, you know, how, how much work we're asking this poor thing to do. Um, so we're gonna see like 16,000, right? No, 64,000. Oh, well, first off, I should make this a format string. There we go. Um, oh, no, 250,000, right? So the poor thing's doing work over here, right? But, uh, you know, 8 bits is not nothing, right? So yeah, maybe if I'm doing 40 bits in my real design, it's not super comfy, I didn't exhaustively test that much, but this is still not the worst, right? And so for small things, you can exhaustively test, perhaps four loops help you get there. Um, cool. So, yeah, I mean, I can run maybe, I'll put 10 in there and we're gonna sit here for, you know, 10 seconds and while it runs. But, uh, you know, eventually this is gonna peter out, right? Exponential growth, not a good idea. Um, we're gonna need to get smarter, but even though this isn't very scalable, like I said, a lot of times you get away with this and hey, you know, why not test everything, right? If that's, if that's a possibility, why not do it? Um, 
I just realized that what I just made is not four times bigger, but uh, perhaps eight times or 16 times bigger. So it might be more in 10 seconds. We'll see. Um, go, Lappy, go. Uh, let that run for a little bit and I'll come back to it. Um, it might finish. We'll find out. Uh, okay. So if exhaustive is not possible, another thing you might try is random, right? Well, what if I just randomly pick numbers, right? And so, uh, sure, we can randomly, you know, pick uh, both a magnitude and a sign. Um, in this case, we're actually just picking a signed integer and then, oh no, right? No, we're, we're picking a random uh, a Boolean and then you can see we're negating the number. And then the great part is we can just, you know, use that thing we made previously and just pass it in this random function. So notice how we keep building up these functions and then reusing them. So at the end of the day, you know, this testing collateral has not been a ton of code. It's actually been reusing itself kind of very cleverly, keeping things under control, and then do some random tests. I'm actually printing out the test so we know what it's doing. Uh, although maybe my copy is still busy. Yep, I have it, you know, smoking hot with tests over here. But um, maybe I'll go ahead and kill this one. I wish I knew the answer, but no, it's going to... Oh, did I really hang it? We'll find out. Yes, for a while, a question while crashing, yes. Oh, okay, yeah, so uh, I'll, I'll generalize your question to, uh, is there something between fully uh, exhaustive and random, perhaps something in between? Yeah, there's definitely things in between. Um, so you suggested was you know, striding, yeah. You can definitely go through design space in perhaps a more deliberate way. Perhaps you can go through your design space in a deliberate way and then add a small amount of randomness to it. So it's not exactly, you know, a certain stride. Uh, you can imagine all sorts of other things. I suspect in the research community, we're going to see in a few years, probably a lot of papers coming out of how people use LLMs to generate not just tests, but like good tests, right? You can imagine, sure, you can generate tests, right? That's not going to be too hard. You can do that today. But I think it'll be exciting to see if LLMs can start generating good tests. And they're probably the secret is going to be using the LLM to analyze the design and then based on design, make tests that trigger the corner case. Remember I was telling you earlier how when you have like that clear style of testing, where you actually look inside design, you can see the key cases, you can try and exhaust those cases. You can imagine the LM tool do that would be pretty cool. Um, so that might be the future. Meanwhile, I should make sure my lappy is not dying over here. I think it might be. Um, we're gonna just play it safe and we're gonna declare bankruptcy. Um, so yeah, as you can see, brute force testing. You need to be careful. You don't even know how far it can go sometimes. And apparently I didn't know how far it could go. Um, so we're just kind of rebuilding up our infrastructure. Great, okay. And then, yeah, there's a random one. Now, oops, with the random one, look at the numbers here. Not super important, but let's say I do it again. It's different ones, right? <laughs> That's random. Um, now, that's either a good thing or a bad thing. Uh, it's good because, you you know, by having different tests, you're trying out more things. It's bad because, let's say it does find an error. Well, then how do you fix it? Because then you write it again and maybe go away, right? Uh, and so one of the key things you want to do when you're doing random testing is to make sure you log your inputs so that way later on you can reproduce the test case. Uh, another thing you can do when you're doing random testing is you can do what's called seeding the random number generator. In other words, you just seed the random number generator. It's not random anymore. Now it's set on a certain predetermined path, but it's still helpful. Uh, and yeah, we can, of course, here we did, you know, only four or five tests. We can say, why not do 12 tests? It's easy to let it run longer. Um, random can be quite effective. The thing about random is it's often known for finding bugs early on in the testing process. But once you have basically a done design that's like nearly fully polished, you're trying to find the last few corner case bugs, random testing is probably not gonna find them. But early on, oh yeah, it'll find stuff for you. Um, so, for example, I might recommend as a methodology. At first, day one, human written test. Close the loop, get something running, get off the ground. Maybe if it's simple combination, you can do brute force. Uh, at some point, get random going, and random will help carry you for a long way. Uh, and one of the cool things about random is that in this case, we're using random to generate the inputs, we're using the model to generate the outputs, and then we can kind of put them all together. But at some point, that's also going to run out of steam, and you got to start figuring out a more deliberate way to kind of generate those last few test cases to really get those corner cases. Cool. Question, yes?
Yeah. Oh, great question. That's my fault. Uh, so uh, DUT or designer test is a common thing in hardware design. People often call it a DUT or whatever. Um, on some of these slides, you can, you know, revise them different years. Uh, sometimes I use it C as in C for component. I've been trying to use DUT just because sometimes C might be confused for a number. Like, you know, some of these slides we love A plus B. You might be thinking, oh, A plus B equals C, but no, C is actually the component. And so uh, I should make a note for myself to make sure that it'll all be done in the slides in the future. But yeah, I bet you in the homeworks it probably C some of the time, and that's totally fine. Okay, so that was just, you know, our first example of trying out some tests. Now we're going to get a little more spiffy, right? So uh, if you look at the test files we provide you, you may notice that they look a little bit interesting. The reason why I look a little bit interesting, I'm saying that way, air quotes over here, is that it doesn't look like code sometimes. And the reason why is using Scala test, which has this really interesting um, API taking advantage of Scala's language features, which has this kind of very human readable, human writable uh, way of expressing tests. And not only is Scala test cool, SPT fully understands it. And so that's when you do things like test inside of SPT, it knows how to do Scala test. You can do only a certain pack, you know, only a certain test, we're doing test only. And then, you know, whatever package is in, in the class, for example, uh, you know, homework three dot, you know, game of life, whatever you're trying to do. Um, and Jill test is designed to work with Scala test. So Scala system helps for us to kind of organize test cases, right? So one of the things you want to do is you often want to have, uh, you know, one of these test cases that is Scala test friendly. So uh, in this case, you know, you have to add this boilerplate on here to make it integrate with Scala test, sure. Um, that syntax we're using earlier this really concise, let me go back a little bit farther. Um, this really concise syntax like this where it says test and then it's the module and this takes off like that. This is like a really concise syntax that tilt us added and make it more friendly, but you can imagine it's actually a lot more complicated. Um, and so something like, you know, this other one's kind of a much more natural thing. You have like a class and you extend something. But you can see we're actually doing is we're inscribing the behavior of the component first and then this looks like English, but it's actually Scala. It's legal. Um, and here we're describing our test cases, right? And then internally, then we call the test like from before. Uh, but the cool part is we run this. Oops. Uh, you see that, you know, Scala test groups it together. So everything that has the same behavior block uh, is together. And then you can see uh, these black text, that's the printfs from the actual code. The green text comes from a test. And see, it's kind of all nice how it labels the things uh, in green with tests. Um, and if they fail, they'll be red. Now, in this case, it's actually kind of hard to make it fail because the interaction is totally automated, right? If I was to change one of these inputs, it's going to change the expected output, right? So I have to go digging deep in there if I want to break it. But uh, it's a good starting point. Question, yes? Correct. This is a string label. Uh, this is not being parsed by the tools anymore and just being repeated. Um, however, yeah, to me, it's kind of crazy. Like, you know, it should not look like code, right? But like I said, Scala is this ability where in places where you'd often call like a function call, you can omit this, the dot. And places where you'd have an argument, you can also omit that. So I believe this might also work. Might need to, you know, it might actually force you to use the funny syntax. Yeah, right. Which one do you prefer, right? <laughs> this, is, this is one of interesting uh, capabilities of Scala to do this. I think it's kind of fun. Um, but you can see how it works under the hood, where you're often able to omit periods or parentheses when you're doing function applications. But like I said, for, for testing, you can just kind of treat it as boilerplate. It should, it should, it should, and then the thing you want. Uh, and then behavior within the class that controls all the things. And so a very common pattern will be when you have your chisel component, you will, you know, make a class to test the chisel component. Uh, you know, you know, it'll extend, you know, any class back with chisel Scala tester. And then, you know, you have the behavior of that component, you have to test for that component. Cool. Questions? Okay. So, uh, one more little thing to help out, you may have noticed this in the last homework, is something called bundle literals. So uh, we often love bundles, right? Not just for IO, but even for just packaging things internally. 
to manually poke every single wire is kind of a pain in the butt sometimes, right? Uh, so that's where bundle literals come in, where you can now set an entire bundle all at once. Uh, what's interesting is that despite all the language changes, this has been an experimental feature now for what, four or five years? I don't even know, I've lost track. But yeah, you need to import it from experimental. Uh, but here's the syntax for setting a literal. So in this case, you know, we know our bundles are a Booleans, a bool sign and a uint magnitude. And this is the syntax, right? You are um, doing all this stuff. I wish it was a little bit more concise, but this is kind of the, the manner of what it is. Um, so basically, the bundle literal syntax is to say dot capital lit, you know, get lit, and then um, fill in the fields. Uh, for now, you can treat it as boilerplate and turns out to be a while for application here at the underscores. The name of the field and then the thing it maps to. And remember, these need to be uh, chisel types, right? So either dot b or dot u. Um, it's a little bit more verbose than I would like, but you know, if you have a bundle, this is sometimes more easy than having you know a long list of um, pokes. And you can see um, when it comes to actually poking it, now that you have this thing, you can just poke the whole thing. Uh, we're actually demonstrating a few different ways of doing this. So on this first line, uh, to actually get the right type for a bundle, we actually grab the type by looking at the module, right? So rather than knowing what the type is, this is introspection, right? It's actually saying, hey, give me the type of whatever this input port is, and then I'll match it, right? So this is considered a good software engineering practice where this way uh, there's no chance of us diverging things. This alternatively is probably a more intuitive way where you just, we know it's a sign and magnitude bundle. We just instantiate a sign and magnitude bundle, right? That's probably more clear. Uh, right now, these both work and it's correct, right? But understand that um, this longer way is actually perhaps a little bit better because let's say you change your design. Let's say you change the type of that port or something, right? This one's going to break. This one's not going to break, right? That's kind of the goal of code sometimes is to have code that's more robust, easier to change. Uh, and so this is you know, a prim uh, principle you may have heard of, you know, of the uh, dry principle or to don't repeat yourself, right? If you go from the software engineering course. Uh, in other words, you know, if you have something that you're going to do multiple times, multiple places, rather than having you have code essentially copy, paste, duplicates of each other, as a result, if you change one, you got to change all of them. Instead of have all of that code descend from the same place, in this case, that bundle specification is going to be the same place they're all reading from, in which case they're all going to be the same type. So there's other ways that can be a little bit more robust and a little bit safer, but you can see that, you know, this chill type of declaration basically is doing the exact same thing of reproducing this bundle. Another benefit is, for example, is if you grab the type of like this, it's going to correctly populate that bundle with the right parameters, right? We had to know this for the same as that for, for example. Once again, there are places where humans can get this wrong and break. And especially if you're doing testing, it's the last thing you want to break. Cool. Questions? This is helpful uh, to make your test cases not so verbose. Um, now we're moving on to the main course. So we've covered how to do chisel tests, Scala tests, testing in the general concept. Uh, let's actually try to test something that we're really unsure of, right? And that is a sequential component, right? Something that's got state internally. Now these are much harder to test, right? Because uh, the possible sequence of inputs gets really big, really fast, depending on how long you're running a simulation for, right? And so Exhaust testing is probably not going to be feasible. And, you have to kind of, and the thing is, not just about one cycle at a time, the prior results also matter. And so to play with this, we're going to be doing this on our queue. And you know what? We're actually going to use Chisel's queue, the one built into the language, which you know we hope and we probably suspect is correct. But it'll be helpful for us to kind of work with this. So remember our queue, we take you know a type, what's going to be inside of SPIFO, right? The number of entries. We covered these parameter properties last week, right? These pipe and flow parameters. Flow is going to be false, so we don't have to worry about that today. It's going to make your life a lot easier. We are going to make pipe true, right? Meaning, if the queue is full, normally if someone tries to enqueue to the queue, it's going to say, hey, I'm full, you can't enqueue. However, taking advantage of digital hardware, if your queue is full and someone's enqueuing at the same time someone is dequeuing, then it's okay, because then that thing that moves out, it can be replaced. And so, yeah, we're actually going to let that scenario happen. Okay, so... First thing we're going to do, we could try and do manual test case, but you know what I'm going to tell you from the beginning? 
too much work for evenness, too much work. So even from the get go, we're going to write a model. This is not a bad thing to do, right? When you're first trying to do an agile hardware design for something, trying to write some Scala code to have the functionality you're trying to do is a great way to get started. To kind of think about, well, how should this behave? How do you know what's right? Um, this is a good thing to kind of do. Now, the only challenge, of course, is writing code in any program language is not quite the same thing as writing hardware. It makes it a little bit different. You gotta be a little careful of how you express things. But we're, we're gonna be clever and be kind of on top of our game and make sure we get it right. Um, in particular, some things that come up, for example, let's say you have a register. Remember, when you have a register, the values doesn't immediately change, right? It challenges the next clock cycle. So you need to make sure when you access that from your code, um, you do the right thing. So for example, if you have a register, you should uh, read it first, write it a second per cycle. If you do that, life is good. Um, maybe even more complicated hardware design, you can want to figure out some sort of clever way to kind of like buffer all your register inputs and make sure you don't get anything wrong and apply them all at the end. That's also possible, um, but we'll see. So to build a model of a queue, what are we gonna do? Well, first we're just gonna use the Scala language's built-in queue, right? Easy, right? Done. Not quite. Uh, that's gonna do a lot of lifting for us, but we're gonna need to do some more. Uh, we're gonna need to do all of the um, IO, right? And make sure it behaves the right way. Remember queues and chisel have decoupled NQ and decoupled DQ as their ports. And so remember when a decoupled port has a ready valid signaling as well as the actual bit payload. Uh, and so we gotta need to mimic all those behaviors, right? So uh, for example, on the DQ side, whoever's reading from the queue, they need to indicate going back into the queue if they're ready. So the DQ ready signal. So I'm actually making this a var inside this class, but we're expecting people to externally modify this to indicate if they're available to take things or not take things. The reason why this is a variable rather than a function parameter is because we're gonna to need to use this in places where it's not obvious the DQ would have access to it. But the DQ can set it in the beginning and does the right thing. Likewise, if someone wants to know, is this queue, you know, actually able to emit something, you know, is valid, true? Well. Valid is only true if the queue is not empty, right? If there's something in the queue. If the queue is empty, it's going to say, hey, I can't DQ. Um, now, if someone actually wants to uh, DQ, uh, sorry, DQ, I said, sorry, then you can see what we do. Okay, well, uh, if the output fires, right? In other words, if someone already made this true and the queue is not empty, that's why we say DQ valid to make sure it's not empty, then sure, we'll give you something. Notice how we actually are using the Scala option type in the case when we actually get sent. Uh, you know, so nothing gets sent, we'll say it's, nothing was available. Uh, and then for the NQ side, communicating back to whoever's sending things to the queue, we're going to tell them if we're ready, right? And well, when, when are we ready? Well, if we have rooms, so in other words, if the queue currently, current occupancy is less than the maximum number of entries, or uh, if the queue is full, but we're dequeuing, right? That's the pipe parameter. And then if someone wants to NQ, they give us the element. Um, and if we're ready, we'll add it on, uh, et cetera, right? Now, you notice when I have a note here, make sure you call attempt DQ before attempt NQ. In other words, yes, if you call DQ before NQ, it's gonna make a spot and then fill it in if it's full. If you call NQ before DQ and it's full, it's gonna tell you you can't do it, right? But it's that thing that we kind of make sure you understand your timing semantics. and. That sounds a little complicated, and I, I agree, I understand, but sometimes think about your design carefully and what you expect the behaviors to be to go way to make sure you really get it right. Okay, so here's our you know, model of a queue. Uh, so even using our model, here's a manual uh, exercising of the model, right? So, you know, for example, we can say, hey, is it ready to NQ? Well, we just made the queue, so it should have room. Yeah, okay. Uh, is DQ, is it okay to DQ? No, it's not because there's nothing in the queue, right? Um, then of course we can, you know, tell it DQ is definitely not ready. Um, we attempt to DQ, it says, nope, nothing's coming out because nothing's in the queue. Uh, at the very end, let's try to add something to it, sure. Um, now we say, is it able to take anything? Yes, because it had room for two and something was already in there, sure. Uh, you know, is DQ valid? Yes, because um, you know, uh, there's something inside the queue now. Now we mark the DQ is ready. We can go ahead and pop the result, right? And so we get the one back out, right? 
Now, let's say, for example, I made this queue size one. Changes the behavior, right? Now, when I try to do um, this NQ ready, it says false because it's full. But there is something there, and the one comes out, but the two never got to get in. So you can see we probably have the right functionality there. I can tell you this. I didn't get this right the first time I wrote it. But, man, this is a lot of manual effort here. Here I am constantly checking things line by line rather than just, you know, quickly writing test cases. We need to work at a higher level of abstraction, right? We need to, we need to move up. Um, okay, so uh, I could try to maybe use a for loop here to uh, do a more interesting interaction. For example, like let's say we want to fill it up and then drain it. In other words, what happens is code is going to attempt six NQs, uh, and then after three, it's just trying to start DQing. So you can see, you know, NQing, uh, we keep uh, putting things in there. Eventually, it's full. Uh, and then we try and start DQing, and stuff starts coming out. You notice how we lost three in the shuffle, and the reason why is when we NQed three, it was full because only two entries inside this queue before we started DQing. Uh, so let's make this three entries. We should now have that. We get the one, two, three. Sure. Uh, you know, we can play around with this, make it only one, uh, et cetera, right? But you, you get the point. So we have some functionality here, but at this point, even though the model's telling us the behavior, at this point, we're only testing the model. We aren't even automating interaction between the model and the hardware design. But we're making progress. Okay, I'm going to pause for questions so far. Okay, so let's, let's try <laughs> comparing manually, as you see here, the model to the actual design, right? So we have a model. We instantiate it. Uh, we say we're ready to DQ, and then we start poking things. And if your eyes are glazing over how much text is on the screen, you're not alone. Uh, this just barely fits on screen. Uh, it ran, and there's no errors reported, but I'm probably not super confident because of this, right? I don't know about you. Uh, but we can still kind of go through some of these test cases a little bit on our own. We can see, for example, oh yeah, you know, we uh, asked the Q model, you know, hey, should DQ be valid? And it said no. Okay, so, it, well, it says whatever it says, and then, because the test case passes, apparently I got that right. You know, you can see most of the things we're checking against, we're doing expects, right? So we really are checking the thing. We are poking things. Um, remember how our model returns an optional type, right? Uh, Sorry, an optional type or an option in Scala, right? And we can see here we're using is defined, right? If we actually get something back out, we're actually checking it. If not, we don't check it, right? Um, so it, it's doing the things, right? But this is pretty verbose. This is not something you want to be writing if you can avoid it. So we're going to do more automation still in just a second. But you can see, right, we went from building up this model to uh, this thing as the model even do anything, kind of make sure the model itself is probably correct testing the model more sophisticatedly. Now we're trying to start meshing the model with our design. But right now it's pretty verbose and a lot of human work. What if we said automate the interaction, right? Now we just function sim cycle, which is going to take in the model and the design and actually connect them all up together, right? So you can see uh, it's going to um, do a lot of pokes and expects accordingly. Uh, you know, for example, you know, checks the results, if it's defined, um, I need some input from the test generator, right? I need to know, is it actually NQing anything? Uh, is it actually able to DQ anything, right? And what data should we be NQing or DQing? Uh, and internally it does all the rest, right? Uh, including an advancing time and printing the state of the queue. But guess what? After all this work, now here's the good stuff, right? In just this one line, we can write the interaction this queue is supposed to do. Right, it's using the model to do the testing for us, discoding all the plugging and connection things for us. Remember, the queue has six freaking ports, right? You know, nq.ready, nq.valid, nq.bits, dq.ready, dq.valid, dq.bits, um, all these things, right? But we built up enough collateral here where we have the model and this code here to integrate the, um, or it's not integrate, automate and integrate the interaction between the model and the design. And so as a result, we can see, see this tiny example. Okay, let's go ahead and, you know, just sit around. Let's NQ something and let's DQ something. And we see the interaction of the queue growing and then shrinking again. So this is good.
this is a lot of work, but it's really worth it. And this is where we get the real power. Because you can see that you did this once for one interaction, and now I can build a lot of interactions on top of this. But yeah, this is the this is the this is kind of the core meat, right? Between the model and this, this is the kind of key things to get right in your design. Uh, for homework three this week, uh, we wrote a good portion of this part, but we're asking you to get the model right and also your chisel right. But understand this handshaking part in the middle is also really important too. Questions? Yes. What? Why no waveforms? Oh, waveforms are great. Um, so I have been doing this later in today's lecture. Uh, waveforms are good for debugging and development, but they do not suffice for testing, right? Because a waveform needs to be inspected by a human, right? Uh, so yeah, great for, de great for debugging, great for development. So yeah, while you're doing this, you're definitely going to want a waveform. Uh, however, you know, when you're running automated tests in the server, it should be checking the values it expects. It shouldn't be doing anything with the waveform. Cool. Question, yes. Could I use bundle literals here? Uh, perhaps. Yeah. So, I mean, for example, for NQ, uh, rather than setting both, you know, the bits and the uh, ready, I'm uh, sorry, ready of the bits and valid, we could try and send both at the same time. You can. Uh, with the bundle literals, sometimes if you do only part of a bundle, it's not totally happy. So it's a bi-directional bundle, like it would be for the decouple interfaces. That's a little bit awkward. Um, also, to be quite blunt, the, like each of these lines to me is long enough, <laughs> and so having a longer line is not appealing to me. Perhaps my own personal style. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's one of these things where the, the area is conserved, right? You know, if you <laughs> have half the lines where each twice as long. Um, I think in the example I was showing earlier, right, the the lines were really pretty small otherwise, and so these ones are pretty meaty, right? Um, oops, I already skipped past the part we were. Um, these are getting pretty meaty, but everyone has their own style. The key thing is to make sure um, it's testing the right stuff, right? And that's the thing. It's one thing for me to um, get your code, look it over. It's another thing for me to, like, test it, right? Let's imagine somebody hands you code and says, oh, yeah, this is code. It works. And it's like, you could check it every line, right? That may not be scalable if it's a 10,000 line project, right? So what you're going to want to see is you're going to want to see tests. And so if you're smart, you're going to be doing is you're going to be checking the test cases, see what the test cases are testing, and then use that to make sure you trust the thing, right? Okay, um, so let's go ahead and so we, you see we're working our way up there, right? We got ourselves a model. We now automate interaction with model and design. So you can imagine, of course, the next step is going to be uh, automating the actual use of that thing. So in this case, we're going to fill our queue up and then drain it. So you see, okay, yeah, let's go ahead and, you know, say NQ yes, but no DQ, or then DQ, but no NQ. And yeah, we can see we fill it up and then we drain it. Um, and even though it just says sim cycle, that function we made isn't just simulating a cycle, it's actually setting things and doing expect, making sure it's actually doing the right stuff and comparing that against the Q model to actually have the right behavior. So yeah, of course we can, you know, uh, make this bigger. Why not? Sure. Cool. Okay, so here we did like, you know, direct fill, direct drain. Uh, we also can, of course, use randomness. We're randomly going to NQ or DQ uh, and see what happens, right? Uh, we keep running this. We see different behaviors. But the fact that nothing's erring so far tells us it's matching our model. So hopefully our model's correct. Um, cool, and we can make this, you know, even much longer interactions. And you notice it's kind of a random chance of how many consecutive uh, NQs you get to see how deep the queue gets. So yeah, uh, I'm trying to see if it we'll ever gets three deep. And the answer is it won't because our queue depth is only two. <laughs> okay. But now it has the possibility of getting deeper. Yeah, there it goes. We can get three NQs in a row. Cool. Questions? This is a pretty crazy thing, right? Cues are um, pretty cool technology. Uh, obviously, we're using a lot in our designs. And here we're doing a test of it. And they're not easy to test. Um, so uh, we're going to leave this for testing. Uh, as I mentioned a couple minutes ago, right, the goal of testing is to write good test cases. But the test cases aren't going to be mostly written by humans. But we're actually going to write code to generate test cases for us. We should be doing a lot of thinking about what we're testing and how we're testing. 
But at the end of the day, um, we want the actual testing done by computers, right? So it's a much more scalable, much more automatable resource, right? Get humans out of the loop, right? We make the tests and get the, well, I make the test, make the test infrastructure, get it going and then let it do the work, right? So print statements and waveforms are great for debugging, but they aren't testing, you know, if someone gives you code and you ask them, oh, where's the test? And they're like, yeah, just simulate it and make sure like line 14 is 10 and line 27 is 15. It's like, bro, that's not, that's not a test. That's a, you know, it's not a thing, right? You got to make sure that's actually a real test. Um, random can be good sometimes. It's good for getting started, but you know, eventually uh, it's not going to cover everything. And um, assertions, right? So we saw in our test cases, we say dot expect. But actually, in your chisel code, you can use an assert that actually will be a simulation assertion. So it's not going to go into real hardware, but if you're doing simulation either a treadle or even a Verilog simulator, it'll do a Verilog assert. Um, those are good for testing things or kind of keeping an eye on things. So my advice for assertions is not so much to use those for the primary testing functionality, but to make sure you catch issues early on when you're testing things. And sometimes you'll have a test case and you'll fail. A failed test case in testing is actually not a bad thing. It's actually a good thing. What keeps people in the industry up at night, late at night, is when you have all of your tests pass, but they're worried there's some corner case bug you've not tested, right? That's what's much more scary. If you have a failing test case, guess what? Then you can fix it, right? It's far more fixable if you have a failing test case. What you don't want to hear is all your tests pass, and the customer says the thing doesn't work, right? What do you do there, right? <laughs> That's a problem. <laughs> you do not want to be in that situation. If you have a failing test case, you can fix that. That's a good place to be. So that's the kind of point. You want to be writing tests and eventually writing failing tests, and then you can fix them or fix your design and pass those tests, let's just say, and then you're in good shape, right? Um, and so uh, my experience is it's often good to, uh, when you have these kind of test cases, you often find after all this debugging, tracking, tracking down how to fix this error, things kind of go off the rails early on, but it takes a while for it to actually manifest the wrong output. And so think about what invariance you can have about your design to... Um, Make sure it's on the right track, and that's what assertions are for. So especially with a really long simulation bug you find, and you know what it is, consider making that assertion later on if you have that scenario again. Sometimes it's how you spend a couple days, a couple weeks, finding a really weird corner case bug that's really subtle. Put an assertion there, so that way if it comes up again, you, you see it coming. Um, now, other people use assertions much more aggressively, and that's also cool too, right? I remember I mentioned how people will write their testers in Chisel. And even though these you know, checking components aren't actually synthesized, they're still using simulation. Those are driven by assertions, right? Those are using assertions to see it's all passing their tests. Um, additionally, uh, assertions are going to be the gateway we're going to use later on in this course to do formal verification, right? So it is possible in Chisel to do some types of formal. And in order to do that, we're going to be able to express, you know, concretely what we want the behavior to say. We can't say, oh, formal testing. Make sure my thing is correct. That's unspecified. The tools can't do that for you. But it can tell you if you say, hey, make sure this thing is always less than zero or something. It might be able to solve that and tell you, yes, I can guarantee for all possible executions, your design will have less than zero for some constraints. And so thinking about searches is still very helpful. Um, but like I said, for now, we're going to try and make good test cases or I should say good test case generators to kind of help us out with that. Cool. Other questions? Uh, in a couple of weeks, I should reach out to the speaker to make sure he's available. Otherwise, I'll be doing it. Uh, basically, we kind of, as you've seen for this course, we've been sprinting to get through the content, get you through the homeworks, and then it's going to shift gears when we shift to project mode. So there'll still be new lectures, but the lectures will be uh, either myself or guests. Uh, and uh, we're trying to teach you as much chisel as we can now to help you get, good, get you in a good place to get started on a project. But then once the project's underway, the content will be, I guess, still helpful. It won't be as, you know, language critical. But yeah, lab six normally will be the formal verification lab. Cool. Other questions? Okay. That's all, folks. Thank you.